Excellent. So before we move on, just a little thing as my massive head is in the way. The full version of the slides are at this bit.ly page. I will uh, be posting slides uh, throughout the session that reiterates this URL, but it's just bit.ly openstack-ipv6-barcelona. Um, it is about three times the size of the slides we have time to go through in here. And so if you love TCP dumps, horrendous looking debugs, um, and all of it in glorious color, uh, that is uh, in that deck. Uh, so we've got a lot of content to cover with a lot of diverse topics around IPv6. So we're, we're going to get rolling uh, as well as having a, hopefully a live demo in here. So deploying IPv6 in OpenStack environments. So a quick poll, how many people here know anything about IPv6? That is fantastic. Uh, so that's good. We don't uh, have time for a primer, and we're not going over a primer. So if you have any questions afterwards about uh, why is this thing in hexadecimal, um, then I'll, uh, I'll deal with your questions uh, at the end of the session, but we're going to get rolling. Uh, so my name is Shannon McFarland. I'm a distinguished engineer at Cisco Systems, working on things dealing with cloud and networking and containers and um, lots of stuff like IPv6 that no one else wants to work on. Um, so I've uh, been at Cisco 17 years. I have uh, worked on OpenStack since just prior to Diablo, and I have uh, worked on and written books and so forth around IPv6 since 2002. Um, I had a full head of hair before I worked on v6 and OpenStack together. Uh, but when we put the two of those together, um, I was done for. So a quick look at our agenda. Um, we are going to just touch base very quickly on general OpenStack plus IPv6 kind of considerations. It's, it's really less about OpenStack specifically and more about just general cloud um, stuff. Uh, what we need to, to kind of uh, take into consideration as we move into anything dealing with cloud, especially OpenStack with IPv6. And then we're going to jump into the tenant facing side of IPv6 and that's where we'll spend the bulk of our time. Um, I uh, am not going over control plane IPv6, meaning what it is that you're doing uh, from a keystone endpoint perspective or what you're doing on the database side. Right now, we're focused in this space because as, as a guy that talks to customers and engineering uh, from companies all over the world, 99.9% uh, .9 of them are all caring about getting v6 inside of the tenant space so that those folks can serve applications out of that uh, tenant domain. And so that's where we're going to focus our time, and then we'll end on um, what we're hoping to do next time and some future stuff. So again, here's that bit.ly link to go get the full presentation. Please get that presentation. I have no idea why summit after summit we post a video, but we don't post slides. Uh, but you absolutely want my full version of this presentation because it goes into nauseating detail on literally every topic that we're going to go into. So you definitely want that content. Um, also, uh, I've got a bunch of IPv6-focused heat templates out there spanning from Juno to Newton. Um, so you'll want to grab that off of uh, my GitHub page. And specifically, uh, you'll want to grab this uh, new v6-only uh, LBAS v2 YAML. I'm very creative in my, uh, in my naming. Uh, but that is the actual one we'll use in our demo today. Also, um, there's a, a bunch of like Docker posts and OpenStack posts that I have at debug-all.com, which is usually where I... Uh, uh, dump my stream of consciousness. So this is the only slide that even resembles a salesy, threatening tone. Uh, I am not in sales, nor am I not in marketing, so I don't give a shit if you ever use IPv6. Um, so I have absolutely no want or wish to sell you anything or to convince you of IPv6. But if you literally have forced yourself under a rock for the last five years and don't know about this thing called IPv4 address starvation, then you should be fired. Um, <laughs> but, but the reality of it is, is that this is an issue, especially in various uh, geographies and market segments that you're facing some sort of public facing V4 a uh, starvation issue, and, and all of the RARs, RIPE, Aaron, uh, Afrinic, Apnic, all of these guys have very, very concise information about if they've already exhausted their, uh, their public address pools, um, how do you get IPv6 address spacing for your organization and so forth. Um, also, as a guy that's 
written multiple uh, CVDs and design guides and tech briefs and a book around deployment of IPv6, I'll tell you that it really sucked not too long ago. And it is much, much better about uh, getting IPv6 into your organization, especially as we kind of walk through what we're doing with OpenStack. So there, there's not many excuses for you uh, to not be doing IPv6 in some context in your environment. Now, when we look at kind of the hard stuff, which is gluing probably something that's new in your environment, maybe like a cloud, whether it be a private cloud or you're tying a hybrid cloud in with, with AWS, and now you maybe want to do some sort of linkage to OpenStack, um, that may be new for you. And then when you add in the complexity of a brand new protocol like IPv6, you put those two things together and bad things begin to happen. Um, and, and so if you plan them out and you kind of know where to begin and where to avoid and maybe until the last possible moment, um, those things will help you. Because inside cloud, we have some very complex things that are very protocol dependent. We've got API endpoints. We've got to communicate to various databases. We have virtual and physical networking involved, of which we not only need to get basic connectivity, but we need to take into consideration things like management and high availability and securing those aspects. So there's a lot of things involved uh, for IPv4 alone, but when you add IPv6 in, it, it gets pretty gnarly. We've had kind of a tumultuous time with IPv6 in the OpenStack realm. It's taken us a while to get to a fairly usable uh, production quality environment that we have in IPv6, and we're gonna talk about some of those features today. So I feel fairly comfortable about where we are from the basics of IPv6, from a core requirement, uh, but there's some very important things that we do need to do that we'll talk about in the future work here, such as uh, IPv6, IPv6 prefix delegation with high availability. Um, what do we do about IPv6 only with metadata environments? Currently, we have no support for that at all, and we'll talk about that further in the deck. Um, but we do have stuff that we can work with today, and we're going to talk about the tenant-facing side of IPv6 and what our address assignments look like for things like stateless address auto configuration, or do you want DCPv6 involved in your address assignments? Um, we also want to talk briefly about how much IPv6 do you really want to start with inside of your cloud environment? So we'll talk about this notion of dual stacking everything versus this conditional dual stack where I'm just going to pick a part of my cloud and enable IPv6 there because that's really uh, where my customers are demanding access. So we kind of graphically take a look at these two approaches, this dual stack everything uh, approach and the conditional dual stack. So dual stack everything is pretty brainless. It is literally put IPv6 everywhere there's IPv4. Um, and that sounds easy, but it really sucks. Uh, it especially does when you are looking at how do you automate the deployment of your OpenStack environment in such a way that you have both v4 and v6 side by side working. You've got endpoints that work, the database access works, all of the stuff in the control plane, the actual functionality uh, that provides tenants access into the cloud. Um, so, so that's a really hard thing to do. So, most of our uh, customers that we know out and partners and definitely those of you in, in the community have kind of echoed back. What we're really after today is just getting tenants to have IPv6 support so that they can run their applications and those applications be available to the outside world. So that is really where the bulk of everyone that I know of that has a deployment or is working on a deployment is doing it via a conditional dual stack environment where they're leaving kind of the control plane, all of the API, all of the database, all of that stuff is still IPv4, and now they're just enabling either a dual stack, and when I say dual stack, I mean two protocol stacks, IPv4 and IPv6, uh, together in the same tenant, or they may be creating a brand new tenant that is IPv6 only, and we'll be talking about how we deploy some of these. So we're gonna start off with looking at the three main address assignment types that you have in tenant. This takes whether or not you are running uh, provider networks or whether you're running uh, with Neutron L3 and you've got you know, routers involved, uh, but there are three supported types of getting uh, address assignment out to your environments. Before we turn on our address assignment types, it's important for you to think if you've not already implemented how you actually handle your IPv6 prefixes for your cloud. 
So the one there on that far left is uh, the cloud provider option, and that is where the cloud provider goes out to RIPE or ARIN or uh, you know, whatever your, your regional registry is and pulls a prefix to use inside this cloud. Every tenant pulls a prefix from the cloud. Super simple, straight, works beautifully, especially if you're using IPv6 prefix delegation that we'll talk about. Now, the second option is totally doable as well. This may be for some of you that are cloud service providers that have enterprise customers that already have IPv6, and they want to extend their prefix into your cloud domain uh, via BGP policies, um, and they want all of their stuff to look like it's coming from their world from a, a prefix perspective. Again, totally doable, it's just BGP. Um, so these two options are, are pretty mainstream. Now, most of you do not look like dumb people. Uh, so I'm encouraging you not to do something dumb and do the thing there on that far right. Um, this is old school legacy IPv4 thinking. Uh, this model that you have on the far right is taking EULA, Unique Local Addressing, which is an RFC 1918 private addressing kind of equivalent in the V6 world. It's a non-routable space. And they are translating from that private space to a routable V6 space. Please never do this. Um, it introduces a crap ton of really bad things in your cloud. Um, you, you break a lot of application stuff. It's not very performant. And if you do want to buy something that's very performant, uh, and I work for Cisco, so please buy these boxes. Uh, they are a very extremely expensive boxes to be able to optimize this type of translation in IPv6. So there's literally no justifiable reason for you to go down this option of translating between two IPv6 prefixes. So once we've figured out that, yes, we've pulled a cloud uh, prefix for our entire environment and we're going to use that to distribute prefixes out to our tenants, um, we're going to go through and, and start creating some interfaces uh, in order to do this. So you guys know this stuff as well as I do. We create a network. Uh, if it's a dual stack environment, we're creating a public facing V4 um, and we're creating a public facing V6. Um, and really the only thing that distributes uh, any kind of change here is that we've got a flag that identifies the protocol, IPv version 6, um, and that our addressing is now hexadecimal, which is cool because you can create names like you can in the old IPX days. Now, if you are using Slack mode, so I saw a lot of hands at new IPv6, those same hands should know Slack. Fewer hands know Slack. Stateless address auto configuration. So Slack is simply uh, a, a, what we call an EUI 64 standard way of providing IPv6 addressing to endpoints. Uh, very briefly, Slack is a host asking via a router solicitation to a multicast group, I want the first 64 bits of my 128 bit address. Some router or routers on that same segment will reply with the first 64 bits for you. Once the host gets that, they take their 48-bit MAC address, split it in the middle, put FFFE in the middle of it to make it a 64-bit address. They glue the two together, and you're on the network. Okay? So that's basically what we've got with stateless address auto configuration. It is a very, very fast, simple, stateless way of getting addresses out to, uh, to endpoints and let them self-derive the last part of their IDs. So all we need to do to enable any of these modes is we're going to tune two knobs inside of our neutron subnet create command. Uh, the first one is the IPv6 address mode. The second one is the RA mode. Um, and we're just going to identify them as slack. So basically this instructs uh, RADVD, which is the, the, the methodology by which Neutron handles IPv6 address assignment and routing within uh, OpenStack, um, and it then knows what mode it should be listening for and responding to these clients, okay? So an example of this would be that we've got this instant down here at the bottom. It's received its IPv4 address. Um, it would come on the network. It would send a router solicitation up to, uh, to Neutron, RADVD, and it would say, I'm listening on this subnet for Slack mode. I'm going to give back to you a 64-bit prefix. And this example is 2001 DBA CAFE uh, 0. And the instance would take that bit, glue it together with its uh, kind of newly formed MAC address, put the two addresses together, and away you go. Now, some things about Slack mode. It does nothing with DNS, no options, no nothing. It is strictly an addressing format, okay? So if you want to get 
uh, a DNS server entry, a, a you know your domain name, you want to handle options, you're not doing that through through Slack. So you would either need to uh, provide that through you know a, a, you know cloud init or some other methodology to to inject that information. Um, one thing that most people get really obsessive about in the Slack mode is that they don't see an IPv6 DNS server because they put it in the subnet uh, and do domain information when they created the subnet. It is totally ignored with Slack, so you don't even, you can put it in, it will never get sent to the client. But because DNS with IPv4, um, the transport of DNS allows me to do queries over IPv4 and get A and quad A records back. So you can still use Slack and use your IPv4 DNS server to still realize all of the DNS characteristics that you need in V6. Now, stateless DHCP V6 is basically gluing a you know, old school stateful DHCP V6 world together for things like domain name, DNS server, and options with Slack. Okay, so I'm getting my address via Slack, but I'm going back and asking for DNS information out of that. So again, we've got our address mode, we've got our RA mode uh, that really indicate what's going on on that subnet, and in this case, we're indicating what our DNS server is, and then the client would, would go through the same methodology it did with Slack, but now it would uh, go back and, and uh, ask RA DVD for option information. And then finally, um, we changed our address in RA mode to be stateful, and this is everything you ever know, knew about IPv4 DHCP um, is the same pretty much with what you got in IPv6 DHCP. It is really, we have a database where we have leases, we can have lease time frames, we can have options, we can do all the things that we had um, in, a, in an IPv4 world, we can have in the IPv6 world. Now, when you move over to provider networks, um, nothing really changes. I mean, we still have um, the capability of having Slack and stateless DHCP and stateful DHCP and the whole nine yards, but within the provider network realm, um, we are probably doing provider networks with VLANs and we are trunking uh, the access of these instances to a network into our physical infrastructure. And our physical infrastructure in this example is actually performing all of our routing uh, functions for us. And so this is a, a reference diagram for you to take uh, later. But when we kind of recreate those networks like we did in the, in the previous slide, um, we're simply saying all the same things we did before, but now the instance is um, using an upstream router, for example, an aggregation layer switch in your data center uh, to perform that IPv6 routing for you. And so these are uh, just the same types of examples that we had before uh, with Slack and so forth, but we're doing them in, in provider uh, networks. And uh, you need to pay attention to this with IPv6 inside of your physical infrastructure upstream. So when we are doing provider networks with VLANs upstream, your infrastructure has to be configured properly to support these three address style types. Okay, so if you've got a Cisco or a Juniper or a Arista or, or you know, a Plum Grid or whatever your infrastructure is, virtual or physical, uh, you need to make sure that you are going into the interfaces that feed these VLANs and make sure that your configurations for those properties are correct. Uh, we can see here that Slack, pretty much everybody that performs um, IPv6 addressing uh, with Slack right out of the, the get-go is default. If you want stateless, you need to turn your O flag or your other config flag on that basically says, I'm giving you a prefix, but come back and ask for uh, your DNS information. And then um, under the stateful DHCP v6 option, uh, we see the uh, manage config flag. Now when we roll into an IPv6 only situation, um, it's pretty much the same as everything we just talked about. We just are missing the availability of metadata to inject information into our instances, okay? So this is really the only differentiator you have in everything that we've just talked about um, is do you have custom information, fully qualified domain names, specific SSH keys, those types of things that you historically have leveraged metadata to provide, um, do you have that same capability in a V6 only network. Uh, the reality of it is, is no. Our friends at Amazon pretty much own the metadata service and it is a V4 only service. Um, and year after year, several people within the community 
um, have tried to go work with Amazon to go in and try to get V6 functionality. We've even got some uh, wish list bugs that have appeared in, in, uh, in some of the Neutron space over the years to try to get a V6 enabled metadata service and today um, it just doesn't, it's just not happening. So your workarounds are pretty easy. You can build into your images the things that you would have put in metadata. Um, or you can use something like config drive, which is where um, at the very top, you can just put the basic properties that you want inside of, like I've got this user data file, um, where I'm just simply saying I want a custom fully qualified domain name called v6onlyinstance.example.com uh, and some keys, and I reference that inside of my Nova Boot uh, statement. And uh, just as proof that that, that uh, config information is overriding it, we can see that I named that uh, RHV6 only drive, but when we actually log into the box, we can see that we actually picked up the correct host name from the cloud config, okay? So this is generally what most people are doing in V6 only environments is they're using uh, a cloud init file to inject all of the parameters that they purely relied on metadata to provide before, okay? Uh, any questions on this one? You just want out of this room. So now, IPv6 prefix delegation. I know we're moving quick, we got a lot of topics, uh, uh, so we're, uh, we're rocking and rolling and, and most of you are still away. So IPv6 prefix delegation, how many people know or use IPv6 prefix delegation? So a handful of people. If you are doing IPv6, um, this is your goal to do inside of OpenStack. Uh, many people do not fully comprehend the importance of this feature. Um, in production environments today with IPv4, we don't have to do day-to-day -day management of which tenant is going to create which private network which with, with which CIDR implementation of IPv4. We have overlapping IPs, we have NAT, and we just don't care. But in IPv6, we have no yet NAT, right? You know, yeehaw, that's a good thing. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that completely changes your operational model and how you distribute IPv6 prefixes to your tenants. Because if Sally gets one prefix and Joe gets the same prefix that he came up with and it happens to be the same one Sally got, bad things happen in your Neutron and networking environment, okay? So we need some sort of central uh, control mechanism that allows us to dynamically distribute prefixes to people um, in a non-overlapping way. So the IPv6 subnet pool support that came around, I don't know, Kilo or even maybe even before then, uh, was the, the, the good first attempt at that, that has allowed us uh, kind of a non-colliding way to create a master pool that people could pull from and they would basically get the next available prefix out of that pool and they would be non-colliding. Um, in large production IPv6 environments, we leverage IPv6 prefix delegation completely outside of the cloud space. Um, this is a very important way for us to readdress even our IPv6 prefixes inside of our network and have it distribute its way all the way down into the host realm uh, without us ever really touching the configuration on any box. So, so bringing that support into Neutron was, was very important. We got some of the guys that authored that code up here in front, and if it breaks on you, they're up here. Um, so, uh, so you can come and talk to, to John and these guys. Um, the only thing that we've got to work on here is that IPv6 prefix delegation today from an agent perspective is non-highly available. Uh, so this is something that we definitely want to be rolling on in the next uh, body of work is making that, that agent functionality highly available. So very quickly, uh, the basics of prefix delegation is you have a requesting router that says, hey, I have uh, a need for some downstream prefixes for my tenants, can I have a prefix? And it will talk to a delegating router. Uh, this could be an actual physical router, it could be a router acting as a relay to another server, um, or you could actually have a server acting as a, a, a server and, and relay agent on the same uh, network. Uh, but it will respond and says, sure, take this address, and it'll assign its address downstream. Now, when you have a host come on the network, it goes through Slack or DHCPv6, um, and it says, hey, can I have a prefix? And that, that uh, requesting router, in this case would be RADVD, uh, would say, sure, take this prefix, uh, and it would create an address, and off you go. 
So um, we'll take a look at some configuration stuff here on how you actually enable this. This is our example topology where we've got an all-in-one node um, with RADVD and Neutron, and we got the prefix delegation client, um, and our uh, private network basically needs uh, a prefix, and our router is going to go and, uh, and act on our behalf to go and generate that information. So from a configuration perspective, you would have in whatever server you have, here's a Dibbler example, you would identify your PD master class, and you would say, this is the pool for which you are going to assign addresses out of. In this case, 2001 DB8 face, and we're going to uh, assign those prefixes uh, by 64-bit increments. Um, and then with inside of Neutron, you just really need to have IPv6 uh, PD enabled uh, for that, and then you need to go and create your networks. Now, the one different aspect over all of the configs that we've seen thus far for Slack and so forth is that we, within the tenant realm, are not identifying our own prefix. We're not saying, you know, 2001 DBA bad phase colon colon 64. We're allowing prefix delegation to do this. Um, and so the, the highlighted item that you need to look at when you're looking at your uh, syntax here is the use default subnet pool. Um, so when you enable IPv6 prefix delegation, it's using kind of that default subnet pool functionality, um, and it will go and then via its request into the delegating router, it's going to learn what its prefix is versus pulling out of a, a, a predefined pool. Now once uh, you've got your public network, you've got your private network, you've linked your public network to your router, the magic happens when you associate your private network to the router. Uh, the second that happens, it triggers a bunch of behavior to, to happen from uh, the prefix delegation agent, uh, and it will actually go up and begin the process of, of obtaining uh, a prefix for its downstream. Now, um, if you've got the PDF or when you get the PDF, you'll see two solid slides of colorful debugs, TCP dumps, and the whole nine yards that gives you step by step what's happening on the, the delegating router side, what's happening on the agent side, and what's happening between the two of them. So um, if you really want to implement this, you really need to understand the flow of how things happen. Now IPv6 with heat. So, we're building a trend here. Let's start with the basic. We'll manually do this. Maybe we'll do this with provider networks. Maybe we'll do our address assignment with prefix delegation. Um, and now we want to look at taking a lot of that pain away and doing this with heat. So how many heat users? Good. So uh, heat with IPv6 is pretty much heat with IPv4. Uh, basic parameters are, are the same. The basic resources are the same. Um, and, uh, and so there's a, there's a bunch of examples that I have uh, up on, on my... Uh, uh, GitHub account. But we basically are going to go through and either build a dual stack enabled heat template or an IPv6 only heat template, okay? So we're going to uh, take a look uh, at one we're going to run in our demo. Uh, so we've got a YAML format heat template uh, from, from the Newton time frame here where we've got a list of parameters of things like keys, images, flavors. Um, we got our public network. We are creating a new private network with uh, IPv6 on it. We can see our prefix uh, that we've got here. Um, and then in our resources, we've got a network. We've got a private v6 environment that's running Slack. We've got a router with a, a router interface talking to that private subnet. We've got a couple server resources that we're going to boot. Um, in this case, they're, uh, they're Fedora images running Docker with Nginx inside of a container, and it's all v6. Uh, only. Um, we're going to create a security group to allow all kinds of magic, and then we're going to create some LBAS v2 resources, such as a health monitor, a listener, a pool, um, and then a, a load balancer itself. And out of our VIP subnet, we're going to create a VIP out of our IPv6 uh, subnet pool, and then we've got our member servers, okay? So, my little MacBook Pro 13 is running two virtual machines with very fat images and several other things. So we're going to go ahead and crank this off, get it running, uh, go back to our presentation, um, and then come back once it's done. So we're going to let that crank off, and it's going to go back, go do all of the orchestration stuff that we need, and uh, we'll come back to it in just a couple of minutes. So now, what about layer 3 HA? How many people are running layer 3 HA inside of Neutron, or do you know that you are or not? 
right? Because the beauty of layer 3 HA from a tenant perspective is you have no idea that your tenant is L3 enabled on, on your routers, right? From a tenant perspective, you don't know that VRRP and Keep Alive D are humming along in a multi, uh, you know, HA router environment behind the scenes. Uh, but from an L3 HA perspective, it's very important that we understand how that functions from an IPv6 perspective. Um, so this is kind of a, uh, a uh, my view of VRRP with Keep Alive D um, in, in the L3 context. Um, you would have an external network in IPv6, 2001 DBA CAFE 17 in this case, and uh, we have tied you know, physical NICs or bonds into bridges, um, you know, BREX, for example. And uh, we have at least two or more L3 agents that are, that are acting in a redundant fashion. Um, and then we got another bridge southbound that's facing our tenant networks. Uh, VRRP is using this dedicated network, which basically is the, the same tenant network structure that you've defined. Um, and we have kind of a northbound facing VIP and about a uh, southbound facing VIP and VRRP so that we have high availability traffic transit north and south um, in both directions. Now, one thing that, that hammers many people in IPv6 when they're looking at L3HA is they're expecting to see like a 2001 blah, 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 colon one as the default gateway of their host and the tenant. That's not how we do things in IPv6. When we advertise out a prefix uh, to a tenant um, on a tenant network, we are advertising the link local address of the offering node, the router in, in fact. So you will not see a 2001 something address appear as the default gateway when you look at a route A INET6 uh, kind of view. You'll actually see the link local address. In the L3HA context, that is a virtual um, link local address that is generated uh, by VRRP and Keep Alive D to basically offer that address out there. So you can see here in the tenant gateway that F435 uh, address, that actually would be the link local address um, in the default gateway structure. So when you take a look at a Keep Alive D configuration file, uh, this, if you've done anything with L3, this should look familiar. I'm just adding the V6 context in here. Um, you'll have an L3HA interface. Uh, you'll have a track interface. You'll have the VIP uh, IP interface for VRRP. This is the 169.254 uh, well-known network. And then we'll have all of the VIPs, uh, both on the northbound side, that CAFE 17 network, and then our CAFE Beef, which is the southbound side. Um, and then you can see all the way at the bottom that F435 uh, link local address is actually what is going to be distributed out to all of your instances as their default gateway. And it will float back and forth between the master and the backup uh, based upon whatever the crime rate uh, uh, might be from a failure perspective, okay? So now let's go back, uh, hopefully, this is probably timed out, it has. All right, so in our topology, remember we had a test network, we had two server instances, we had a brand new router. Um, we've got all of this magic up and running and we've got a load balancer. So now one of the things that's going to take us into why this is great, but what we need to do now to make this easier operationally is now how do we get people on the outside world to come and talk to this VIP or to talk to these instances directly? Well, in an IPv4 environment, we don't do anything to the upstream routing infrastructure. We know that um, there is this router that is answering on behalf of all of the private networks behind it. We can pass traffic to it, and that router will then know what it's translating for. That's how we do things with IP tables and Neutron uh, today with IPv4. But we are not adding that. We need to let the upstream infrastructure know what is going on inside of our cloud space. So that means that we have to go and tell that infrastructure about this routing. So for example, if we take a look at this fixed IP, um, this is the internal tenant facing default gateway on our Neutron router, okay? So if we come over here to an outside node and um, we add a route statement to our next top, which in this case is 17.6, All 
Oh, mercy. Cap locks. There we go. So now we can come in here and we can ping 6, 2001, DB8. And we can get there, okay? And so now we have access to the inside of that. So now we can go to the load balancer that we've created um, inside of our environment. And we can grab that VIP, go back here, and make sure we can get to it. I think I got a space in there. And if all goes well, we're hitting our Docker Engine X containers and we're load balancing back and forth between them. Okay, so the, the purpose of that demo is to not show, hey, this is how amazing heat is. It's to show that we have to operationally restructure what we now do when we assign IPv6 enabled tenants in our infrastructure. Because now when we, via manual, or via IPv6 prefix delegation, we have to go tell the external infrastructure, like we did with that route statement, how to get back into our environment. And so that kind of leads to the next body of work, which is dynamically allowing what we do inside our cloud to be known outside our cloud. Okay, so we've had some, some great work already in the Neutron dynamic routing uh, area within uh, the OpenStack realm of doing some basic functionality with IPv6 BGP. Um, and this allows us to tell Neutron um, how to participate with a BGP infrastructure outside of our uh, cloud to let them know about prefixes we have been creating inside of our tenant domain, okay? Uh, so if you are not looking down this path and you are looking to deploy IPv6, then you need to be having a very close operational relationship with those people that handle physical routing inside of your network. Uh, because you will have to establish a process by which Sally is a new tenant, Sally gets an IPv6 prefix, you need to route to Sally's Neutron router, right? Um, and, and they have not had to do that historically before in the IPv4 realm within OpenStack, uh, but they now need to do it within the IPv6 realm. And so um, it's a pretty basic set of functionality here. We can establish uh, BGP speakers. We can associate networks with those BGP speakers. Uh, we can create peers, both V4 and V6 peers, uh, with other BGP routers within inside of our domain. Um, and then we can advertise prefixes in and out of that space, okay? And then future stuff. So we want to expand this to not only BGP, but IGP. So we would like to get some work done uh, in the next cycle around, okay, what if you're not a BGP shop, you're OSPF, or you're ISIS because you're running a massive data center fabric and they're running on ISIS. Uh, so we want to get some more dynamic routing fed in uh, into uh, the community so that it's easier for us to not only deploy IPv6, but manage operationally the way we get into and out of uh, our environment. Um, we definitely want to get prefix delegation HA uh, enabled because it's super important. Um, if you're not already operationally, uh, operationally kind of tacking towards prefix delegation in your environment, you need to be looking at that. Um, we also have this you know, beautiful situation with inside of OpenStack where stuff that worked in the last release doesn't work in this release. Um, and you know, that just is a, is a part of how things happen when you're shaking APIs uh, you know, between uh, each release and, and one group such as the IPAM group may be doing something different that the other group didn't expect um, and things just kind of uh, appear that you didn't expect. So um, I, I beg of you to not just go out and turn on IPv6 for a basic tenant and it pings and you have, you know, cheered victory. Um, go turn v6 on in your other project types. Um, so if you're doing heat at all, if you're doing LBAS, you're doing firewall as a service, VPN as a service, we need as many people as we can to operationally uh, attack uh, the v6 functionality so that we can kind of close uh, the loops on, on bugs uh, that we may not even know about. Okay, so I'm going to leave this here. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes for, for uh, questions, or you can run out the door. That's totally appropriate. Um, and remember to please poll uh, the full version of this presentation. That gives you a lot more context about you know, what we rushed through. Any questions? Yes, sir. 
if we are using BGP to talk with upstream router about our prefixes, that means we've got yet another point of runtime failure. We've got BGP down just for a second, and all our road, roads are no longer available. Uh, how it's handled in Neutron? Well, so the, the question of it is, hey, we're, we're doing Neutron uh, with BGP now, and uh, BGP is another element that can fail. When it goes away, what are we doing about it? So that's why we want to work on future stuff, is to more tightly uh, integrate the, the automation around what happens both within the Neutron side and the external to Neutron side on BGP. So there's all kinds of things in BGP that help us with high availability. We need to make sure that that functionality um, is embedded inside of Neutron enough to give us, one, uh, the ability to tweak timers, the ability to actually watch peers um, and respond to those peers, maybe go to a different uh, a set of peer groups. Um, so there's all of those things that you mentioned, we need to extend the standard BGP functionality to exist in Neutron, uh, which it doesn't today. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, so the, the question is, what about RADVD? Yeah, so the, the, Neutron, uh, the Neutron pairing with RADVD is to offload that functionality from an upstream router. Uh, for example, if you just want your local tenant virtual machines to communicate and be able to get addressing structure, um, we needed a way to do that without relaying them um, you know, upstream. So uh, inside the presentation is a very good table that actually tells you which flags to turn on and turn off in your RA modes if you want to enable that functionality. So if you've already got routers upstream that you want to relay your request to and pull them down, uh, then you can set the, the M and O bit flags uh, in that configuration to enable that. But to answer your question on RA DVD, it is there to act on behalf of what a router function would be. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, one more question. I think we got a roll for the next session. Go ahead, sir. Can I confirm that the Keystone IPv6 endpoint works? No. I can't. Uh, I mean, I, I did some all IPv6 uh, testing back in Mataka, and that stuff seemed to, it seemed to work great for me, but I didn't beat the crap out of it, so I don't, I don't know if you'll run into a problem with it, but the Keystone work I did in Mataka with it seemed to work fine. Okay? Well, guys, we got the next session in here. I'll be uh, here all week, so uh, tackle me and we'll talk about IPv6. Thanks for coming.